five past. Ah, perfect time to start. Okay, perfect. Um, I am uh, very happy to introduce Matteo, um, uh, who is a PhD student here in Strathclyde. And um, yes, I think that is everything. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Jules. And thank you, Topos people, for inviting me for this seminar. I'm really enjoying the series of seminars that are being done. And I'm very happy to be part of it. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, dependent optics, in a sense. So I'm basically going to explain this picture. And this talk is going to be based on these three papers you see here. I'm going to divulgate the slides after. So you're going to have access to all the bibliography. And uh, as you see, so this, let's have a quick chronology. So the first paper is an extended abstract that uh, me, Jules, Dylan, Heigel, Bruno, and I hope I didn't forget anyone. So a bunch of MSP people uh, put out in December 21 about in the, the problem I'm going to talk about, which is the problem of uniting these two frameworks to talk about bidirectional transformation. So mixed optics and F lenses. So about this problem of the mythical dependent optics. And then we kind of went quiet for a bit because, uh, well, we had other stuff to do. And in the meantime, we sort of kept thinking about it, but not very much until um, Pietro Vertecchi um, published his own abstract, well, paper actually. And I think Pietro is here and I'm really happy for uh, this uh, conversation to be uh, happening in a sense. And Pietro kind of put forward uh, a lot of the ideas that were in this original extended abstract and validated some ideas that I had in the meantime that I wasn't sure were actually you know, valid. So I think this happened like last month. And so I quickly published some notes again because it was like, oh wait, <laughs> this stuff actually works. So I put like basically three days later, I put out some notes in which more or less the same things are carried out. Uh, I have to say that Pietro's paper is much more, uh, there's many more things. Like you figure out a bunch of really cool stuff. And part of my paper is basically exegesis of his in the sense that um, I was especially interested in the way the dependent lenses uh, can be obtained in this framework of dependent optics, right? That I'm going to describe. Uh, and I couldn't do it. And then he managed to do it. And I realized uh, that it could be done. And I realized how this was being done. So there's, I think, a couple of pages in my, uh, in my notes, which are just like, oh, let's see how Pietro did this, <laughs> which uh, was very exciting. So, well, let's start by talking about uh, like the first day of creation that was lenses. So in the beginning, there were lenses. What are lenses? Lenses are bidirectional transformations uh, that you can write down in any Cartesian monoidal category. So let's fix a category C, which is Cartesian monoidal, which means we have a terminal object and a Cartesian product, okay? And then what's a lens in C? A lens in C is uh, a pair of morphism morphisms, one we call S and the other, well, let me switch to small case letters because that's what I use later. Um, that we think of as morphism between like pairs of objects. So this would be a lens between the pair ST and the pair AB, okay, so uh, well, at the end of the day, these are morphisms in lens C, which is a category one can prove. Uh, but let's focus on like, what is such a thing? So uh, what is a lens? So people invented this or discovered this uh, because they were looking for nice abstractions for what it meant to access data. And 
despite accessing feels like a passive thing. So data is there and we access it. Uh, it's actually a bi-directional or like an interactive thing. So um, we access data, so we read data, but we also want to modify data, right? So a lens in this sense uh, is an abstraction what it means to read and write. So this part is called the forward part uh, and imaginatively, and this part is called the backward part and they represent uh, read and write operations, okay? So we could imagine this left boundary to be some uh, data structure that we have and this other boundary to be an interface to this data structure. The forward part of the lens is going to like give us a reading of our data structure. And the backward part is very much a uh, writing operation, which is however contextual on what we did in the forward part. So a good way to visualize what's happening is to actually write this a string diagram. So here we have S, A, F between them. And then the backward part gets a B, gives back a T, but there's also a copy of S as parameter, okay? So this uh, bit here is a copy operation. So that's where the Cartesian structure of C is used. Okay, so this is a lens. And as I said, these were kind of, I think, and people who know better about the chronology of this stuff would probably correct me. I think this was like the original thing of this kind that was uh, invented slash discovered. And then people quickly realized that you could go like much, much further than this in the sense that you could somehow like modify the way that this access and write, uh, writing operation operations happen. And so uh, mixed optics and F lenses were born. So th this comes from very different worlds. So I think mixed optics were kind of like first in a sense. So mixed optics take seriously the idea that when we do this operation here, this pair of operations, the second one remembers something about the first one, okay? So the backward or the like writing part is remembering something about what we did before. Uh, but to emancipate ourselves from this Cartesian context, which might not always be available, this uh, remembering of operation gets abstracted. So what we do now is we still have a pair of objects. I'm going to clarify where these two objects are coming from now. And now our lens-like thing is going to look like, uh, let's see, um, going to look like this. And the way we remember something is through this extra object, which is called our residual, which is this pink M, which in a sense is attached to the dom to the codomain of the first morphisms, and then to the domain of the second one. Okay. And the idea is that this is expressed through something which is uh, co and we'll see this later for dependent optics. But the idea is that these two ends are really the same end. So we're remembering something. And this thing we remember is produced in the forward pass. It's never communicated to the outside because you see the interface with the outside is only A. And when we are ready to do our second operation, which is the backward part, we have these available again as data we can use in our processing. Okay, so the data to define this thing as a called mixed optics is now generalized instead of having one monoidal category. Well, we still have one monoidal category, which I should draw in pink, which is where the residuals come from. And then this, uh, these two operations here are actions of M on two other things, two other categories. So now there is a category C, which is where the forward part comes from. There is a category D, which is where the backward part comes from. And there is a monoidal category N, which is where the residual comes from. Okay. Also, Jules, if there are questions in the chat that should be relayed to me, please 
let me know. And an easy, again, we can visualize this data a little better, an optic. So let me put this aside. We can visualize an optic uh, using string diagrams, which makes them kind of nice. So this is again F, this is F sharp. And M has this appearance like this. So M is, uh, as you see, something that is communicated from the first to the second part and is completely internal. So it doesn't have, uh, it's not an open wire as A, B, S, D, R. Okay. And this also means, and this is something that is like, sort of a consequence of the way these morphisms are defined. This means that if we have like, uh, say if we have here something, a piece of F, which is sort of factorizing as something that is operating just on the residual. Let's see, uh, not being very clear, but pictorial is very evident. So if you have a box here, uh, then the fact that this wire is not actually uh, something that is open, but it's closed, means that this can be shuttled all around, okay? In particular, we can pretend that this is actually belonging to the backward part, okay? So that we have this uh, equivalence relation in optics that tells us when two optics are equivalent, and this equivalence is given by the fact that uh, in, a in a certain sense, an external observer cannot distinguish between them because the only thing that changes is this piece of computation that happens before or after, but only pertains to the residual, which is something which is internal. So something that an external server cannot access. Okay, I, I'm, I'm telling you this because uh, having this equivalence relation like sometimes trivializes optics in the sense that, for example, uh, produces something like lenses in which there is an asymmetry between, uh, you see, residual here and residual there. Okay, so this is one, uh, the first generalization, these are very popular in functional programming, where, I mean, the, the fact that we are generic on this way, the residual is attached to the things we do, makes them very uh, flexible when it comes to accessing data structures that are not record. So traversables like trees or um, co-product types or things like that. On the other hand, and here, I'm not very sure about the chronology, I just know them from this very nice paper by David. Uh, there are F lenses, okay, which I think came out of the need of defining something a bit more general than lenses, but in the context of systems theory, okay. And well, F lenses turn out to be something quite familiar for category theories because they're kind of simply growth and deconstructions. Okay. So you, you could say they are growth and deconstructions with attitude. So they generalize lenses in a different axis in a sense, in a different direction. And they say, well, uh, what if we wanted to have dependent types? So instead of dropping the Cartesianity, which is like, uh, so replacing Cartesian monoidal structure with something which is more linearly flavored, we now replace uh, simple types with dependent types. So the idea now is that these pairs of objects here are not really just pairs anymore, but they are kind of dependent pairs, okay? So I visualize them as this like arrow, which is like in the simplest case, which is dependent lens, this is really an arrow in whatever category you're interested in. But in general, this dependency is encoded by the data of um, an index category. Let me zoom on this. So we have a functor from C up to cat. And then uh, S and A live in C. And the backward part instead lives in, well, whatever is mapped uh, 
whatever f maps s to okay so this in particular lives in f of s and this in particular lives in f of a okay and then we still have two morphisms going back and forth and i'm going to use like the internal language of this index category by saying that the first morphism goes from s to a and this lives in c as i said but the second morphism is like lives above in a sentence okay so i'm going to write this in uh internal notation in a sense i'm just going to call this so if you give me a sigma term in s um and you give me a term you give me something in b but b needs it's a type over a so needs a context in a and this is going to be f of s sorry f of sigma then the result is going to live in t of sigma okay so let's see this uh using diagrams instead so purely uh arrow theoretically in a sense so now again we can visualize b as being some kind of arrow over a so this means uh b lives in f of a and we can see t as living over s and then the forward part is here so i'll have this just to keep some symmetry then what do we do since b lives in f of a and f like big f the hunter is contravariant we can pull back b and get f star of uh, b which is living over s and then we can consider a function here an arrow here and so we see that this part of the lens lives in c whereas this part of the lens lives in f of s all right so you see there what we have are quite different beasts and quite different directions in which this idea of lens is generalized and i think what they the two notions um let's say generalized differently is the notion of uh, residual in a sense okay so again residual is this object here okay you might say well f lens is literally don't uh, but again, let's go back to their common ancestor, which is lenses. So uh, the residual for uh, a lens is this object here, okay, in particular uh, is this thing here. So the way that the two, uh, let's say, doctrines of optics uh, generalize this idea of hoping the input to uh, have as input for the backward map. Uh, so mixed optics think of, of it as, well, I have to remember something from the forward part and the way I remember it could be very flexible. Whereas F lenses uh, take this idea that uh, this S is really a parameter. So it's a context almost in the type theoretical sense so that it's something that my backward part uh, depends on, okay? Uh, so both the types, but especially the map. Um, so let's keep this in mind. Uh, I'll make another observation because that's how we get to the next slide, which is the following that uh, mixed optics, like, and we can see really well from the diagram, uh, kind of decompose as two things. One is, let's see if I can delete this. So one is this, the first part here, the forward part can be considered to be a co-parameterized morphism. What is a co-parameterized morphism? It's a morphism that we consider to be from S to A, but which additionally has something which is dual to a parameter, so a co-parameter. So it's something extra that we produce. And dually, the backward part looks a lot like a parameterized morphism, which may be easier to understand, which is uh, a morphism from B to A, sorry, from B to T, uh, that can access additional information given by M. All right, so uh, I'm, I'm saying this because here at MSP, we are very, uh, we are huge fans of this power and co-power construction. So 
of looking categorically parametric and coparametric morphisms. And so at some point we kind of look at this and say, mm, this is very suspicious, like what's going on here? Like optics seems to be the marriage of a coparametrized and a parametrized morphism. And also we were looking for like ways to accommodate these two things. And so we were like, well, for F lenses, one can prove that, well, since this is like a growth in the construction, um, growth in construction gives you a category, right? But also a vibration of this category on the things, you, on the base category of the index category. So we are like, can, can we express mixed optic in this way? Can, can we say that optics are in some way fibered over their forward part? And their forward part is a copara construction. So it's a category of coparametric morphisms. And so at some point we ended up drawing this diagram, which is uh, a way to express optics as a pullback of, uh, of two vibrations or let's say two, two funters. Okay, the first funter is this thing here that, well, actually let's go in order. The first funter is this one, which is expressing what I told you just now that, well, it turns out that optics kind of are fibered over the core parametric morphisms. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, co-parametrized morphisms are fibered over their parameter indeed in a certain way I'm going to explain now. And dually, one can also like say project away uh, the forward part of an optic and just keep the backward part, which is a parametric morphism, remember. And this parametric morphism is also uh, endowed with a projection of both like this M here, their parameter over here. And so you might see what hap what's happening here. We're saying, well, uh, optics are the pullback of these two projections, which means that if I have an optic and I separate it, I separate it in its two parts, the forward and the backward part, and I see each of it as a parametrized morphism, uh, but a parametrized and a coparametrized, then the only thing that it's missing is the fact that we want the forward part to be coparametrized, but the same object that parametrizes the backward part. And this is the pullback condition. All right. Um, so at the end of the day, we came up with this idea that uh, what's going on in optics, in mixed optics is a bit more subtle than it might look at the first, at first glance. So indeed we have a pair of objects in both on both sides of an optic. So this is an optic here, but there's some, some kind of hidden object here. Why is there this hidden object? Because this hidden object is where parameters come from. So this BM that I didn't talk about now is the delooping of uh, the category of residuals M. So this is what I drew in, in pink before. And I recall that the, the looping of a monoidal category is that by category with only one object and whose morphisms are now the objects of the monoidal category we started with, which compose using the tensor product of that monoidal category and have two cells which are given by the morphisms in the previous monoidal category. Okay, so if, if, if we take like this diagram seriously, um, then the picture of optics is we get is uh, objects are not just um, pairs of like one object here and one object there. They're kind of like objects which are uh, over this dummy object star, which is the dummy object which lives in the, the looping of the monoidal category of residuals. Okay. And indeed, like uh, if one explores this, one realizes that, well, the forward part turns out to be so well. This morphism here, sorry, I should be consistent. This morphism here is the residual. So an optic has a residual, which is like sort of a third part of the optic actually, because it's a morphism again. And the forward part is sort, sort of over the residual as much as the backward part of an F lens is over its forward part. And same applies for the backward part. So what we get is sort of like uh, something that looks like an F lens in having uh, the two parts being dependent over something common. Um, 
so this is what we kind of eyeballed. We said, wait, could it be that then the secret to get something that generalizes both scenarios is to just have something here where residuals are, which has many objects, okay? In such a way that when we index things over it, we don't have just this dummy star, but we have the possibility of like really depending on something, okay? And then when it comes to F lenses, you can just say, well, uh, the residual and the forward part is the same, or like, or you can say, well, this one is trivial. And so I have the, the backward part depend over this, which is actually the residual part that looks a lot like a forward part. And so we had this ansatz, this uh, idea that it could be that like, this is the generic form of a optic like thing. Okay. What we call dependent optics. So a thing that looks either like an F lens or a mixed optic or both, okay? Um, so this sort of high level understanding of like where this idea comes from, uh, but now I'm going to be uh, explaining it in a bit more detail, in particular like what does it mean like this picture here? And what does exactly mean that we have now uh, by category there? What is even an action of a bicategory? Because we need now this bicategory to be a category residual in some way, so to act on the forward and the backward categories. Uh, so I think this might go, be a good time to stop for clarifications if someone is in need of something. My friend chair. I mean, we have some parallel discussion happening. In the okay. Chat, but I think there's enough people answering questions. Okay, uh, okay. Mostly Bruno. Good, I have a team of collaborators, that's great. So we can just... I mean, yeah. we can we can have shout out questions now as well if you want. Well, if, like, if someone has questions, then I'm happy to answer. Like in case there's something that you didn't understand now, you're like, oh wait, before he goes on with all the talk, <laughs> let me ask this very specific question. Otherwise we'll do this later. Okay, I think we're going to do this later. So let me start by like taking a step back. So my goal now is to introduce what an action of a bicategory is, just to understand this idea of uh, residuals living a bicategory. So I grant that we are all familiar with what an action of a monoid is. Well, you don't have to be because I'm gonna to explain it. So uh, we, I guess we know what a monoid is, it's said with an operation, which is associative and identity and has an identity. And it's when it's acting on a set, it's like if we put this dynamical object, which is the monoid, and we use it to animate some static object, which in case is a set X, okay? And you can express this data, the data of an action uh, as, a, as a map that looks like this, okay? So this is gonna take like uh, a scalar in the monoid, an element of the set and it's bring into this like n times x thing. Or another way to say it is to say, well, let's deloop this monoid. So let's consider this monoid as a one object category, in which case like uh, he says just one object. And then you can see that the action of M on X can be packaged as such as, as a functor from this the looping into set. Why is it so? Because now this one object is going to be sent to uh, a set X. So this one object is used to pick the set we want to act on. And then every scalar M is going, which is now a morphism in BM, is going to be sent to the morphism, well, the function M times blank that uh, encodes the action of this little M, scalar M on the set X. Okay. And one might ask, what, what do we want to, to do? So like the first definition was perfectly fine. Well, we can like this, the second definition pays dividends when we want to generalize it to uh, things that are not monoids. For example, we might say, uh, this is a very trivial category after all. So it's very, very easy now to just say, well, we should call action of a category, uh, which I'm going to still call M, but notice this is bold M. Uh, an action of a category should still be 
uh, functor from M to set. Okay, in particular, the action of a category M on a set X should be uh, a functor like this. So we'll, now if we have objects O and O prime and a function from O to O prime, sorry, a morphism from O to O prime, then this gets mapped to a function, which we're going to call like F palette still, from some set XO to some set XO prime. So this action now gets exploded into many pieces and these pieces are all related by the morphisms of F of M. So we can see this in this picture. So this blob with colored arrows here is our category M. And you can see that it has many objects and many morphism between them. And then what happens is that our functor into set, so we can imagine this thing here living in the category of sets, uh, is sending each object to a set and each morphism to a map between the corresponding, well, between the sets corresponding to uh, its extremes, basically, okay? So I'm still saying that the category M acts on the set X because you can say that, well, the collection of all these pieces, if I now like put them together, this forms a set, which is um, this, well, say that all range ranges in M zero in the objects of M. And uh, I didn't say that the, my category M is small, but I say it now. So when I sum over all its objects, uh, some sets indexed by sets, then I can still get a set. So one can say, and indeed one can also give an equivalent formulation, which is which looks much more like this one. So it's like completely internally in set. One can say that the category M is acting on the set X. Okay. Uh, this is just to give like some things to be something to be attached to when it comes to intuition, but uh, I'd really like to stress the fact that this encoding is much easier to work with, at least for the kind of things that we are going to see today. So the way we introduce actions of bicategories then is simply, simply just by categorifying as the joy of categorification, uh, which in my case means like turning bold all the letters and turning in blackboard bold all the things that were read in bold, okay? And most importantly, turning set into cat. So I'm categorifying both the thing that acts and the thing that is acted upon, okay? So now instead of a monoid, I consider a monoidal category. Instead of a set, I consider a category. And indeed the action of a monoidal category in a category is such a thing that satisfies some properties and has some structure. And again, equivalently, equivalently, this is a pseudo functor now. So we have to weaken a bit uh, our, our objects. Um, it's a pseudo functor from the delooping of the monoidal category M into cat. And again, this works in the same way. So the only object which is in the delooping is going to pick up, to pick the category X. And if I have a scalar, this is picking now a functor from X to X. And then now additionally, one would have that uh, if we have a two cell in VM, which is a one morphism in the monoidal category M, then this gets mapped to a nature transformation, okay? Let's say this is N, it's now a nature transformation. And, and again, in the same fashion, we generalize from monoid things before to category things. Um, the same way we generalized before from monoid things to category things, we can do the same now. We say, well, now that we have this way that has of expressing an action, there's no reason to keep just uh, one object by category here. We can go uh, like commit to this idea of a by category and say that uh, the action of a by category blackboard M on, well, this should be a category, this is a typo on a category X is given by a pseudo functor from M to cat, 
all right so again now instead of uh trivial objects we're gonna have non-trivial objects with morphisms between them and now we have something new which are two morphisms and these are mapped to categories functors and nature transformations okay and then here i observe that and it's like a big thing in this this notes I was citing before of mine uh, that it's actually a bit nicer if we instead of saying by category say double category it makes a bit more sense uh, when it comes to studying the Tambara theory of these things but I'm not going to go into this today unless someone asks me explicitly to do so later so these are actions of by categories I hope nobody is too uh, shaken this is an action of a bicategory, just a pseudo functor. And then we're ready, ready to define the dependent of this. So we follow up on our intention to generalize residuals from monoidal categories to bicategories. Then uh, dependent optics are defined in this way. Okay, so this is very similar to the way mixed optics are defined in a sense, uh, in the sense that this is going to be given by a Cohen formula. And we generalize like this idea of residuals coming from a different uh, category, in this case, a by category. But uh, you can also give an exposition which is sim more, more similar to F lenses. And well, let, let's see what this is. So now instead of having a monoidal category and two actions of this monoidal category, we have a by category and two actions of such by category which turns out to be, as we've seen, just two pseudo functors, okay? Which we call X and Y, okay? Then dependent optics for this data, so I'm gonna call this X and Y, uh, like they form a category. This is something that Pietro very meticulously proved uh, in his paper. So thank you, Pietro, for taking the time. <laughs> uh, but it's something that you can prove by like this pullback idea that uh, I explained above, uh, kind of like um, aseptically, then it doesn't tell you how these things actually work, but it tells you that it does work. But anyway, so now the, the category of optics for X, Y as objects, which are given by triples. So we have still like pairs of things, but these are dependent pairs over a common thing. So the way this works now is that J is in M, it's a category of residuals, and the forward and the backward part depend on, on J in the ways that X and Y are encoding, okay? So now S belongs to X of J, and T belongs to Y of J, okay? So you have to think of X and Y as like ways to be dependent over n, so like a notion of dependent type in a sense. Um, and in this case, then it's telling it that S is something that depends over J and T is something that depends on J, but in different ways. In principle, in practice, they can be the same. Uh, so these are the objects, kind of like pairs of generalized bundles and amorphism is what I put here. So it's given by this coend expression, but let's not be scared by it. What it's saying here is that, um, so we have a, a Y, we have a J. So I'm gonna relate the data out in this way. So as you see, like the residual now, as we observed before, is uh, a map. Notice that it goes in this way. Um, this is maybe something that should be corrected in the definition. Of course, it doesn't make any difference if like one puts a knob here and gives all the definitions to be like actions on the, on the other side, basically. So you can correct this direction as you wish. It doesn't matter much okay but we have like m which is our residual which is connecting now these residual parts okay so this is uh, a map in m a one cell 
then what do we have? We have now uh, over J, so as you see in the category XJ, we have a map from S to uh, basically the pullback of A along, uh, along N according to X, okay? So the action of M on A is given by, is going to take A here. And the forward part is something here. Okay, so this is all happening in the category XJ, things over J according to X. And dually, uh, the backward part uh, first, like to describe the backward part, we first get, uh, like we first act on B using the same M to bring it over J. So this is Y of M now of B. And then we consider a map in the other direction now. And this is the backward part. And this is happening over like N Y J. All right. And then this uh, Cohen, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave there and gloss over. This is saying that uh, again, as we've seen for mixed optics, like this M is completely internal. That's what this Cohen is saying. Okay, so the nothing out, uh, nothing is exposed of M outside of the optic we're looking at. And also it's saying that we can slide along, uh, we can slide two cells, okay, because now like MIIJ is, is a category, because it's the home category of a by category. And so this Cohen is saying that we can slide two cells coming from the by category but I'm gonna gloss over this, uh, I apologize. So maybe to ground our intuition is good to have some meta examples. So <laughs> let's see at least how like this uh, definition recovers the two ones we were looking for. We're looking to generalize, we're trying to generalize. So let's start with the easy one in a sense. So mixed optics are the most uh, similar in a sense. And as, in, as anticipated, we recover mixed optics by considering uh, the bicategory residuals to be trivial in the objects. So to have just one object, so one object by category is a monoidal category. And indeed mixed optics have residuals which lives in a monoidal category. The action of our one object by category is the same thing as the action of a monoidal category. So the data is the same. We also see that objects like go back to our the previous uh, definition in which this star, this dummy object was not really there because it's a dummy object. So objects are pairs. And you see that S lives in, uh, so I apologize because I noticed I, I, I've not been consistent with notation. So here X is what I called C previously and Y is what I called D. Okay, so this is the forward part and this is the backward part. So now X, which is something is X dot is the category picked by uh, the action of BM, the pseudo functor BM, Y star is the same. Well, so this is going to like pick C and it's going to pick D in a sense. And we can call the action of M, we can call it M dot, the action of Y, we can call it M uh, blank dot and when we look at like, well, maps between the residuals, which are going, the residual objects, we see that these are exactly recovering the entire monoidal category as before. And so long story short, we get back exactly the definition of mixed optics, okay? So in a sense, what, what we did is we generalized uh, actions of monoidal categories to actions of bike categories, and we got a new definition of optics there. And if we go back and like we look at those special by categories, by categories which are monoidal categories, we recover the right definition. All right. And the other example we're looking for to generalize is uh, F lenses. Okay. And so F lenses are also given by an action of a by category, which is now not a by category which is trivial in the objects, but it's trivial in the two cells. So it's a locally discrete by category. And it has also this op, which is kind of vestigial, uh, I think, uh, by now. Uh, we shouldn't 
read too much into it. So when I say it's trivial in two cells, what's happening is that when we, okay, we write down the, the co-end, then this bit here, which was the residual, which lives in the home category of M between the residual objects. Uh, well, this category is now set because it's the by category of by category M is locally discrete. So it doesn't have home categories, actually it has home sets. And if you take the set, the co end over a set, you get a uh, sum. Okay. So the effect of this triviality in the two cells is to discretize the co end to a sum. And then there's also an operation we have to do as anticipated, like F lenses are a bit weird because if we like uh, take seriously this idea of residuals being like, uh, a third map, then F lenses actually do not have the forward part, but have just the residual part. Okay. And the way we see this is uh, in, in this definition is that to recover F lenses, since F lenses have the data one index category, it means that, and, and we need two for dependent optics, it means that one of them has to be trivial, and this is the case. So we take the first one to be trivial. So now, as you see, the forward part is completely trivial. And how do we recover it? Well, we recover it exactly as this indexing here. So as anticipated, it turns out that F lenses, the, what we call the forward part of F lenses is actually the residual. And the backward part, which is dependent over the residual, looks as if it's dependent over the forward part. Okay, I recognize this is debatable. <laughs> But as Jules is saying, currently I'm sure if this is a bug or a feature. It surely like make the machine work. And I like this duality that we have, oh, dependent optics, and then you trivialize objects, you trivialize two cells, you get different things. Um, I wonder what happens if we trivialize one cells. That's like an open question to even understand what this means. Um, but just like in the last few minutes, I maybe went a bit too slow. I wanted to show, show you how to recover dependent lenses. So that's the title of the talk, right? Dependent lenses are dependent optics. So um, in a sense, I've already done this because dependent lenses, if you, don't, if you don't know this, but are F lenses for F given by the slice, sorry, the codomain vibration. So the slice indexing of a Cartesian, locally Cartesian category, okay? So this takes, I, J, F maps it to the slices. And this F star is given by pullback, okay? So, well, it's, it's, it's F lenses. F lenses are dependent optics, QED. It's, thank you for the talk. But in, in a sense, this is a bit unsatisfactory. Like, that's what put me off originally when I recovered this definition. And then I read Pietro's paper when it came out and I was like, ah, of course. Uh, I actually, I bowl the same uh, like the same construction, but then I couldn't make it work. And now everything checks out. So I think it's nice to just look at it. I'm going to go uh, through it very quickly. So it's another way to get dependent lenses. I think it's a bit more opinionated that this F lenses that are recovered in a way that it's kind of disappointing. So the idea is to, I'm uh, gonna like quickly go through through this. So. The idea is to look at the act, at actions of the bicategory of spans of this I. So let's suppose we fix this I locally Cartesian, which means we can take uh, pullbacks. And so if I is locally Cartesian, span I is a bicategory because I can compose spans by taking the pullback. And there is this action, which is kind of canonical, which is an action one might say on that uh, index category I showed you before. So on this category where uh, index category whose fibers are given by the slices, okay? And the way this is obtained is, uh, as I described here, so if, if you have a span, if you have a span uh, here, PQ, so with apex Z, and you have here a, over y, what you do is you take the pullback along p, so p is here, you take the pullback and you get something uh, living over 
z. And then you have the other leg of the span, which is q, and it's going to j. And now we can you can just compose like this arrow here with q, and you get something over j. Okay. So this is called a pull push, quite in, in like trivially you might say pull push operation. Okay. We first pull and then we push. Another name for this thing is uh, linear polynomials. So there's a whole literature on polynomials, which expresses them as like this pull, uh, like basically in terms of adjoints of some local adjoints over indexing of some index category. And it turns out that like linear polynomials are uh, polynomials in which one part that corresponds to taking powers uh, in this analogy between these functors and polynomials is not there. So it, what you get is like a sum of a bunch of things. So they look like linear things. And I have to say, there's a wonderful paper by Er Schreiber, which is called linear quantization. Uh, well, it has linear quantization, the title is in the bibliography. So I apologize, I don't remember the title, which makes this story of like, these things are like matrix multiplications, very, very compelling and very beautiful. But anyway, so now we have this uh, action of the bicategory of spans and we can go on and make a bunch of very ugly computations, okay? So we look at optics for like where X and Y, the two actions, the forward and the backward actions are the same or given by that span action. Uh, and you see like in this category, objects are these co-spans now. So are like pairs of morphisms over the same thing. And one can go through this calculation and get a presentation of this category of the, sorry, of the morphisms of this category, which is given by this. So I have to say like this step is like this first step here, which is this isomorphism here is highly non-trivial. And this is due to, again, to Pietro. And it's something I independently reproved once I knew what to prove, because one of those things that it's outrageous to come up with and Pietro will tell me how <laughs> he figured this out. Uh, but once you know you have to prove this, you can more or less understand how it's done. Uh, but yeah, once you have this and realize you can do that, you get this explicit representation, which is still a bit disappointing in a sense, but uh, let me break this down for you. It's actually quite, quite simple. So as I said, objects in this category of what I call dependent locally Cartesian optics is, uh, is a pair, is a cospan. And then let's see, a morphism between these two things can be drawn in a way that is reminded of all dependent lenses in this way. So we have the co-domain cospan here. We have the... It is my responsibility to rush you. Yeah, yeah, I, I noticed. I'm just gonna give this and then we're done. We, this is the domain cospan. And now the, like the data of this thing can be realized as follows. So the indexing F is a function from S to A. So that's great, we put it here. And then what the rest of the expression is saying is that we first take the pullback along F U of this U prime so we get this thing here. And then we post composite with V. So we get this uh, composite over J. And then we consider a, a, a morphism from whatever is there to, to V prime and to T. So, well, should probably. So this is what we can call a sharp. So if you're familiar with dependent lenses, this looks very suspicious and I don't have the time to show you that this suspicion is well, uh, like is well motivated because it turns out that uh, this is, there is a functor here from this dependent uh, optics to the usual dependent lenses. So this is uh, what some might call poly eye. And this functor, which is very easy to actually describe, but a bit long, is an equivalence. So we might very well say that dependent locally Cartesian optics 
which is like this construction of dependent optics using the data of a locally Cartesian category does indeed recover dependent lenses. And I'm gonna cut short here. Thank you for the attention. Yeah, I'm gonna come over here and use your microphone, otherwise we're gonna have problems yeah. again. So are there questions? Maybe your microphone is open. Oh, is yours? No, mine is open, yes. Yeah, this is just easier, I think. I'm also just out of view, but yes. Uh, questions, people. Uh, we also have uh, Pietro in the uh, in the call, who can probably also answer. Uh, am I seeing everyone here? Yeah. So I think Bruno has uh, raised the end. Yeah. So go ahead. Uh, I'm in no rush to ask a question. I sort of imagine somebody might have might speak up and say. Yeah. Uh, um, my my question is based. So this is amazing, and and I think I still have to completely unpack the span construction uh, in mm -hmm. my head to properly understand this. Um, what I really wanted to maybe bring forward is this thing that's 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 bugging me, and this is what is sort of what we mentioned about the bug versus feature thing. And I think it's maybe a good time to mention this now that like everybody is here or most people who are interested in this are here. Um, so the fact that with this Pietro's definition and the, the, the things you're telling about here, the, this definition of dependent optics, uh, if we specialize it to mixed optics and then specialize that, that, that construction to lenses, we don't get the same thing as if we just straightforwardly specialize the thing to F lenses. And I don't know, for me, that uh, it's, it's sometimes it's like very hard to... Uh, vocalize why that's a bit strange and it's unsure as Joel said, whether it's a bug or a feature, but I'm just curious on what everybody thinks about that. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, that's, that's really, it's a very open-ended ended question. Yeah, so if this is a question, which I think it, you said it is, um, yeah, that, that's definitely true. So I don't know what has been going on in the chat. Maybe you already explained this very well, but uh, what I was uh, saying here uh, is that, like, basically, what what I've shown here is that uh, dependent lenses can be obtained in two ways as dependent optics. One is by specializing as F lenses first, as Bruno said, and then doing the usual construction, and the other is by using this uh, this different construction, which is a bit more principled where you use the action of spans. And, and indeed you get two different things. And I think there is one difference, which is the way you represent like, so uh, let me go back again. Something already said, but I will stress this again. So where I am, so here, okay. So now dependent optic in a sense uh, have three parts, it's just forward and backward anymore. It's forward, backward and residual part. And if you do like dependent lenses in the old fashioned way, what you get is a dependent optic, which is like basically only this part. Okay. Because as we've seen, it's going to be trivial in the forward part. Uh, if you do it in the second way, instead you keep like these two parts more uh, balanced. Okay. Of course, like this is kind of a empirical observation, not really a justification. Uh, but I think it's giving like different uh, weight to different parts of the of the optic. Mm, maybe Pietro who thought about this knows something better. Yeah. Well, hi, Matteo. Thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks for a really nice talk. Really enjoyed this. Um, then actually, I I confess that dependent lenses, so the construction with the span, was my. Um, was my original motivation to look into this um, for computational reason, for uh, reverse mode automatic differentiation. Because this has a kind of a key computational advantage that you can store computation in the residual M that you can reuse in the backward pass. 
And this is something that you need a lot if you are doing a basic back progression or a neural network. There's a lot of stuff that you compute as you go forward uh, that you want to just store in memory and have for free as you come back. And uh, basically only the span construction give you this, the previous dependent lens, they don't have it. Um, the same idea that Bruno's uh, intercaps talk was about like one yeah. month ago, right? Except the non-dependent version of it. Yeah. And I think, yeah. Peter's observation, is, uh, if, if I may paraphrase, is that like if you decide to trivialize the forward part, then you are forced to use the residual part as forward part, and then you cannot use anymore as a storage. Whereas in the other construction, you use pens, then you're keeping the residual uh, for possible storage. So, so this it's is operationally uh, different, even though like quotienting out some some things make it uh, the same. So this is uh, evidence that it's a feature and not a bug. That this is actually pinning down yeah. some genuine operational information. Exactly. I think we, we uncovered like a very, very tiny difference between these two construction, which is highly non, non-trivial in a sense, like you wouldn't see it otherwise. Yeah, so basically, actually my goal with the band optics was to use the band lenses, but to have this extra little thing. And uh, uh, there, there may be also a little geometrical intuition Mm -hmm. If you actually uh, draw what you get, so basically the uh, the category equivalence that Matteo was describing, because um, if you are considering, uh, I, I I will always have kind of reverse mode differentiation in mind. So sorry if that's not intuitive, but um, if you consider the kind of the uh, David's uh, dependent lenses approach, then basically you have an uh, arbitrary an arbitrary bundle, so a space over another. And if you consider non-dependent lenses, you have a product. And with this, uh, so it has to be fully trivial. And if you actually draw the span construction, uh, you have a bundle that splits partially in that it, it is a, um, basically it is the pullback of uh, T that you bring back over S. So there's a little bit of geometrical intuition that you can put as much stuff uh, in the, uh, how much you can put or not in the residual depends on how much a given uh, fiber bundle splits. So I think it's actually interesting to go, uh, kind of go in detail and write down uh, the, the equivalence because it goes through this, uh, this construction. Yeah, it's a pity I couldn't actually go through it. But also, I, I think we probably think about this differently because the fact that you realize that that lead isomorphism in the Cohen computation, which to me was completely you know outrageous and unreasonable, <laughs> I think it it shows that you understand something I, I still don't. Like you have some intuition about what why that is even true in the first place, that makes it ah obvious that I I didn't see it. So it'd be great if. Uh, in the future, you can explain this to us uh, in much more detail. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a sign that dependent optics was a good question all along, that there are multiple very different approaches to it. I mean, I've been asking what are dependent optics for I think, at least three years. But I need it for totally different reasons. Are you happy now, Jules? I am extremely happy. <laughs> good. So let me quickly mention, I see Bryce complain about my lack of terminal objects in the locally Cartesian category. And yes, you're right, there should be also a terminal object because we need products. Uh, we have a raised hand from Lee. Yeah. Lee, please, you, you have the floor. There was a slow internet connection. No. Well, then, if... Uh, Lee, can you hear us? I think that's a no. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions or comments or stuff? Uh, this is around the time that we would normally wrap up and then degenerate into non-recorded discussions.
All right, so I think that means that let's wrap up and stop the recording and then anyone that wants to hang around a bit longer can do so if you're, yeah. if you're happy. Absolutely, to absolutely. All right, so thank you again. Thank uh, you for inviting me. <laughs> So let's, um, uh, you can stop the recording, right? Can I, yeah.